The word comes from 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verses 4 through 7. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. You may be seated. The title of my message is Paying the Price for the Gift of Love. As I was meditating on the price that we pay for gifts during the holiday season, we go out and we're looking for um, a reaction from our friends and for our, from our family for the purchases that we go out and we make uh, during the holiday season, um, starting in uh, November around Thanksgiving time, this is a time when we gather together as family and we have an expectation that as we gather together, there's going to be joy. There's going to be this feeling that we get to rejoice in. But as I start thinking about the price that Jesus paid and the gift that he gave of his love, I considered the look of love. The question tonight that I will charge you with is asking you, have you ever stopped to think about the price that Jesus paid as he knew that he would be going to the cross? See, the word talks to us about Jesus being in that place, sweating great drops of blood. The word also tells us about the fact that Jesus knew. He knew everything that he would have to endure. Jesus realized that he would be humiliated. He realized that he would be betrayed. Jesus realized that he would be flogged. He realized that he would be nailed and hung on that old rugged cross for our sins as a sinless man. Now, I want you tonight to take a moment. And in that moment, I want you to realize our Savior being hung, the process of nails being hammered in his hands and bones dislocated as they hammered. And him without sin did not say a word. I want you to stop and realize when they pierced him in the side, him without sin paying a price to gift us with the ultimate love. I want you to realize the breath that was taken out of his body just so that he could go down into hell and snatch the keys up from the hands of the enemy to give us back dominion over a place that God said belonged to us. Now I want you to take a moment and realize the importance of the perfect gift of love. As I speak to you on tonight, I'm gonna give you a moment of transparency for me the word I, I prepared, I'm, I'm really good with words. The word I prepared, God said no. He said he wanted me to be humble. He wanted me to come from my heart and he wanted me to give you what it looked like from the eyes of his pain. Somewhere, somewhere, now it's not written in the word, Somewhere we grew to believe that 
Love was supposed to be warm and fuzzy. Somewhere we grew to believe that love was supposed to make us feel a certain kind of way, the hair stand up on our backs and back our necks, and you know, it comes with a pretty package and a bow. And somewhere we were made to believe that we could expect that presence would give us joy. But at what expense are we making that great exchange? Oh, as I think of the Savior hanging on the cross, when I think of the torture as he was flogged 37 times, beaten, because I decided I didn't want to stop sinning. Flogged because I decided that I didn't want to stop fornicating and I didn't want to stop drugs and, and, and I needed another chance. Oh, the only grace period that God gives us was that breath that we just took. We take so much of our lives for granted. Jesus may have known what he was going to do, but you don't know what tomorrow will bring. We're stating tonight that this Wednesday is the last Wednesday, hallelujah, of 2018. But somebody just took their last breath. Somebody just got caught up in a car accident as I stand here holding this mic, and they didn't make it to church. So the heart of repenting is a gift. The grace that God gives us and his mercy is the perfect gift of God. While we're striving to give gifts and we're striving to have our own way, God is saying, but my son, I sent for you as the perfect gift of my love. Love is reciprocal. Love is something that there's an expectation that we give that back to the Father. There's another scripture in 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. I want to draw your attention right now and charge you. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. And it says, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. It says, surely you know. That word, surely you know, has everything, nothing to do with Francetta, nothing to do with Pastor Peoples. It has everything to do with the assurance that we have in our spirit because we know that we're taking the time to ask for repentance. We're taking the time to spend in the word. We're taking the time to have a relationship with our father who died, hung, bled, and died for our sins. It says, surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. You have failed the test of genuine faith. As you test yourselves, I hope you will recognize that we have not failed the test as apostolic authority. Apostolic, excuse me, authority. Now, in order to be an authoritative of anything, it requires us to have knowledge, amen? So now there is an authority that God gave us in the Genesis. There is an authority and a dominion that God gave us over everything that we sin against. The first sin wasn't Adam and Eve. The first sin came from Satan when he was disobedient and he was separated from heaven. See, we don't stop to look at those things that are not written, those things that are not seen. 
That's where the Holy Spirit has to come inside of us and give us a spirit of discernment. And that's something that we have to all pray for. See, coming to church, it doesn't matter that we come to church. The devil does not care that you showed up here tonight. What, he, what concerns him is when you start opening up this word in the midnight hour. What concerns him is when something is ill and you, you say, Jesus. What concerns him is instead of you uh, having an issue with your brother, your sister, the leader in the church, that you apply the word of God and you go and ask them for forgiveness. What concerns him is when you look to the hills which cometh your help, because you know that the help comes from the Lord. What concerns him is you having a heart of forgiveness and a heart of thanksgiving that he just gave you another opportunity. What concerns him is that you don't allow yourself to walk around contaminated by sin. What concerns the enemy is our obedience, because that's better than the sacrifice. What concerns him is when we start reading this word and we start realizing that we're giants, we're not grasshoppers. When we feel like we're a grasshopper, just look at your shadow. Your shadow's always going to be bigger than life. And understand that the battles that you are fighting, we serve a father that owns the, bat, the cattle on a thousand hills. We serve a father that he spoke everything into existence. We serve a father that loves us so much that he made a decision that his only child died for our sins. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have anybody in my life that I know that will willingly suffer and die for anything that I do. I, I don't know. Do you? I, I don't know anybody like that. And if you do, introduce me to them. I need me some people like that in my life. The term agape is what they call Greco-Christian term referring to love. It's the highest form of love. Charity and the love of God for man and man for God. The word is not to be confused with philia, brotherly love. And let me stop there for a moment. The expectation that we have from people we have to stop and understand that we're an imperfect people. Jesus died not just for one of us. He didn't die for me because I did anything wrong in particular and didn't die for you. The term brotherly love, it encompasses every human being with breath, which means that we have to have a bigger size love and forgiveness for those little things that may get on our nerves or those little things that may separate us from the love of God, of God. Those are the opportunities that the enemy will take to come into your life and sever your relationship. And before you know it, your grace period's expired. See, there is no guarantee that we get to say, God, forgive me. There's no guarantee that we get to repent later. There's no guarantee that we get to be mad for a week or two until I feel like going to somebody. There is no guarantee that as a wife, I get to be upset with my husband and not resolve, resolve the situation before I go to sleep. Sometimes we got to be okay with the fact that it is what it is. Agape love, brotherly love. 
as it embraces universal, unconditional love that transcends, persists regardless of circumstances, and that's according to the Wikipedia. But I want to stop right there on that agape love. There's people that go to church on Sundays, that go to church on Wednesdays, that go to church whenever, on Fridays, whatever time period they go. And we're all serving or we're coming to get something from God. As I stated, the price for the gift of love is very unconditional. It's very unconditional. But yet we feel comfortable with walking in the knowing in our mind. See, it's in the mind, um, according to 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5. It's in the mind where we have that opportunity to shut down all the strongholds as we may exalt ourselves when we are in a certain situation in our lives and we think, oh, I'm right and she's wrong and, and they did this to me, so that justifies me doing this to them. See, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5 makes it very plain. We don't get to do that, y'all. The Bible is very clear on the type of love that we are to extend to each other. And God calls it a gift. It's his gift to us. God extends a love to us. In, in Exodus, the 20th chapter, the third verse, he makes it very clear that we are to honor and love God. He is our first love. So the expectations that we may have from another person will never be fulfilled unless we first love God. The Bible tells us in Matthew 6, 33, that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and all things will be added to us. Now, we can assume that we can rest on that scripture, but I'm going to take another transparent moment. There comes a time in your life where your belief has to meet your faith, and then your faith must meet some trust. Trusting in the Lord thy God is a bigger picture than you can even imagine. That walk alone in just believing, because we all think that's what we're doing. But when the circumstances and situations shift on you, and you can do nothing but trust in the Lord, at that time, that's going to really test your faith. At that time, that's when the price that Jesus paid, because if you've ever gone to the house of the Lord, that song is going to ring into your spirit. I will trust in the Lord until I die. And everything will work itself out. But we have to walk that trust thing out minute by minute, day by day. Trust doesn't look like what Jesus saw. Trust doesn't look like an image of, of, of a forecast of what we see ahead of time, what we're getting ready to go through. Trust may be connected to that very person that you didn't want to apologize to. Trust may be connected, your miracle, your next may be connected to the very person that you didn't want to associate with because you assumed, because somebody told you, but we have to bring our thoughts in, we got to bring them thoughts captive and understand that the perfect gift of God is the gift that he extended us to love. And if we love him first and we love by example, there's no doubt that we could. The only time we're going to ever have an issue with ourselves is when we don't allow ourselves to abide by this word of God. 
Every word of God is yes and amen. So as you're reading the word of God, it's not anything to doubt or question. I know some people talk about the books not being in the word and talks about the word not being complete. But you know what? I would rather take my chances on this unfallible word of God and this instruction that clearly tells me how I'm to act and how I'm to behave. And it's real pure and simple, cut and dry. It doesn't take a lot of effort and it's what I would want to do anyway because that's the reciprocal part of it I want to be treated back the way I treat you and if I had to stick my fist down inside of me and pull me out I have to make a decision would I want to deal with me ask yourself that question tonight are you a person that can be duplicated. And would you want to be around the duplicated part of you? In every way that we think about the perfect gift of love, see, we're not a perfect person. We're just not. That's the beauty of it all. The first scripture that I read in 1 Corinthians 13, um, 4 through 7, see, that, that gave us the, the outline. That gave us an outline that we can abide by at all times. If we have to have a reference from tonight, it's the greatest gift of love. And the outline is those things that was mentioned there. And forgive me, I'm a little off of my subject here. Um, patient, kindness, not being jealous not being boastful or proud or rude. So tonight, I just want you to kind of do some inventory because 13, 2 Corinthians 13 and 5 said to examine ourselves, right? So y'all don't take this moment as a moment where, oh, friends set us up there preaching tonight. I really need you to examine yourselves, not because I said it, it said it in the word. I want you to take your time out and let's not do church tonight. Oh God, let's not do church. Because Christ didn't get up there and act like he loved you. He showed love by being pierced in the side and nails. And just imagine someone pounding in his hand, just taking that stake and just pounding, pounding and bones breaking and blood gushing out. I'm not trying to be gory. I'm just trying to be real. Christ never tried to break a habit. What he did, he walked out a perfect life so that he could give you perfect love. He didn't ask you to be perfect. He asked you to repent. He asked you to strive because he said in his word that the steps of a good man is ordered by the Lord. So our steps are already ordered. He said that when you was in your mother's womb, he knew you and that he called you to be a prophet to the nation. So tonight as I stand here and look at all these prophets to the nation and I think about the duplication process and I think about the fact that if we all just read the word and trust, believed and allowed our faith to all meet at one place, that we too can give the perfect gift by crucifying that dead part of us that we don't need anyway, allowing that part of us to die and having a spiritual obituary. And we can grieve that part of us, but put it behind you so that we're able to continue on. Sometimes we won't get the answers to those that hurt us. But see, God came. And he, he came to set us free. He came to set us free from the, if we give forgiveness to the people that hurt us, guess what? That breaks the strongholds that we have on our mind. If we allow ourselves to walk this thing out the way that the word from Genesis back to Revelations advises us to do, we don't have to worry about being in bondage as the children of Israel were because we already know what's required. Part of that was not murmuring and complaining. 
See, that's the thing about tangible gifts that we give, that we get. Sometimes we don't always get the right color. We don't always get the right size. Today, the malls are full of people that didn't get what they wanted. But see, we can't question the perfect gift. We can't question the perfect gift of love because somebody loved us enough to die for those wrong decisions that we made. Somebody loved us enough to die because they knew that our heart wouldn't be right toward our brothers and sisters of the faith. Somebody loved us enough to die because they knew that we would be charged and challenged in our flesh with flicking over to those triple X and to picking up that telephone in our flesh, just feeling a certain kind of way about a certain kind of somebody. There's a lot of things that we need to address because you can fool me. You can't fool God. That's why he said, examine yourself. That way nobody else has to. Glory to God. Point number two is establishing a foundation for the agape love. Could you post uh, Psalms 119, uh, 34? You have that? Okay. In the meantime, I'll go ahead and there, she, there it goes. Okay. Give me understanding so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. One of the issues that we have in the body of Christ is we have a heart issue. We have a heart issue with making decisions what's going to be pleasurable and feel good over the thing that's right. I like what Minister Antoinette was speaking about um, when she ministered last Wednesday when she was talking about how we go to the grocery store and somebody might give you some extra money and we don't stop to look at the fact that their drawer is going to come up short. We call it a blessing. See, that's a heart issue. That's something that I've had to deal with in my life, and I'm just being honest, and I'm sure I'm not the only one in here that we've had issues that we've had to go through, and glory to God for his grace period. But we have to ask God to give us the, the understanding. That, that's where it starts, in understanding. The understanding comes in our mind. So we have to get to a place that we submit essentially to our mind and we understand that junk in, junk out, junk in, junk out. Our minds are computers. And whatever we deposit inside our mind is going to be that thing that's going to come out in that time when we have to make that decision. If we don't have the word of God in there, we have nothing to stand on. We have nothing to help us to process whether or not we're going to make a good decision or not. Going to Psalms 86, 11, and 12, and I'm, I'm just taking my time this evening. I hope y'all are right with that. You can write these scriptures down and take them home and read over them later because these are just foundational scriptures that God placed on my heart so that you can have them to refer to. Um, this scripture references, teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may live according to your truth. See, my truth is that I'm okay. Because, see, if we don't think that we're okay, that's going to charge us to do something different. So we don't intentionally get up in the morning and be like, well, I'm not all right, so I'm just going to go terrorize the world. That's not what happens. We take the wounds from our childhood, the fact that we were kids and something may have happened to us at a certain point in time in our lives, and we adapted a behavior. So a lot of things that adults do is we learn how to shut down and go into our corner, and we learn to not communicate. But that's not the way of the Lord. See, the Lord needs us to communicate with him. So that's a behavior that we have to learn. The way of the Lord 
It's communication. Right? Amen? So if we're asking the Lord to teach us his way, that we can rely on his faithfulness and ask him to give us an undivided heart, meaning I'm not getting ready to rely upon what Francetta may feel or what Francetta may think. Because what I know is according to the word of God, my father just said, don't murmur, don't complain, trust me, walk in faith. There's a whole lot of principles in the word of God that if we just abide by those, that'll keep us on a positive tip right there. Because we don't have to be double-minded. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. So when, 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 when I get that extra money, if my heart is not divided, if I know what God has instructed me to do, which is to treat people the way that they want, I, I want to be treated, to love my neighbor as myself, then I don't want anybody doing anything to me. So therefore, I'm going to say, ma'am, excuse me, you overpaid me. Let me give you this money back. And I'm going to walk out and I'm going to be able to declare the victory. I won't be bought and sold for $25, by the way. The price that was paid for me is way worth way more than $25. It's worth a little bit more than $100. It's worth a little bit more than $1,000. What are you willing to sell your soul for tonight? What are you willing to sell your soul for tonight? Because every decision that we make, not to reciprocate the love of God, every decision that we make, not to find out through the pages of Genesis to Exodus, is a decision that we're making to basically have a spiritual death. Y'all, this is real serious. We were placed here on assignment just like Jesus the baby was born on assignment to die for every decision that we make as imperfect people. There was no doubt when God sent Jesus down that he would be sending him down to die. There was no doubt about that. Think about 33 years. 33 years being on earth and your assignment is to die. 33 years. I will praise you, Lord, my God, with all my heart. There's that heart again. I will glorify your name forever. I don't know about anybody else, but, you know, whenever I'm around people and this holiday season has been difficult for me, um, first holiday season, I've been without my grandmother been real difficult for me but being in God's face has brought me a lot of comfort I it wasn't a requirement for me to be around a lot of people so I shut myself in and just stayed in God's face for Christmas that's what I did but I started thinking about um, different chapters as I was reading and searching through, I started thinking about different people that I've been able to experience just being here in this church and the love and the expressions of love that different people have given at different times. By the way, uh, Dwayne and Rashonda, congratulations on your engagement. <laughs> but I, um, I call the man of God. Well, I sent his, his fiance a text and asked her if she would have him to call me because I started thinking about um, just the communication, there's that word again, that I was able to have with the man of God and earn the level of respect that I did with for the man of God. 
I start looking and, and, you know, just going back to like Noah and the flood and when God destroyed the earth. And I start thinking about Noah, you know, being so favored by God that God had gave him an assignment to build this ark and the faith that he must have had in God to spend that 120 years building that ark when there had not been any rain. Y'all know the story. But then to think about the drunkenness uh, Noah just flipping the script, and after after they got on dry land, you know Noah's job changing, and he had to at this at this point in time he had to now start um, a gardening. He he had to start actually um, what is it called? I'm sorry, I'm lost for words right now. He planted a vineyard. Let's just keep it on the word. He planted a vineyard. Okay, and then what Noah did next was when the time came and the vineyard started prospering, the, the grapes and the things for him to make wine. It fermented and he drank it and he got drunk. Well, I started thinking about what all the man of God saw when God told him to close the ark up. All those people whose grace period expired that day the fact that Noah had to see people drowning, the babies, the parents, all the people saying, Lord, Lord, let me in, let me in. The bodies floating in the water. I started thinking, and then I thought about my brother Dwayne that was in Katrina, and he was saving lives, and he was taking people to the dry shores. And I started thinking about some of the times that I've counseled and I've talked with him about the things that he had to endure and he had to go through. And I started thinking again about the perfect, perfect gift of God. He didn't drown. He didn't drown. He was... He was able to be saved, but he was also on assignment. See, y'all, you have to know that word to be able to put it into context. Can you imagine being that one that God said to go ahead and get in the ark and there's all your family that you never witnessed to, all your friends? that you never told about God because you didn't know? You didn't put enough word inside of you to tell them what thou said the Lord? You didn't give them, you didn't pour out of your vessel and into their vessel anything of substance? You didn't tell them about the perfect gift of God? And so they had to suffer. We have to extend love to our families, to our friends. That's establishing a foundation of agape love. There's an understanding that we must have regarding this walk of faith. There's requirements. There's definitely requirements that we must have and that's point number three. The requirements that we have for next level, um, the scriptures, she's just going to post those. And for the sake of time, I'm going to go through uh, my notes. There's a lot of us. I can't speak about anybody else, but I can speak about myself. For a long time, for over 50 years, I walked around hurting. I walked around not understanding what had gone on in my life that had made everything so wrong. I didn't understand the abandonment, the rejection. I didn't understand those things. But when I began to understand about the perfect gift that God gave me was life, grace, his mercy. And when I came to him broken and wounded just as I was, and when he removed everything away, I started serving 
And I start giving my all. And I start do just whatever I could do for, for this person or that person or for the church or, or whatever. And, and, and I was giving, giving, giving. But I forgot to forgive myself. So one of the things that we have to do in understanding the requirements to get to our next level is to start forgiving yourself. Start understanding that it's okay that we didn't have all the answers. It's okay that we've been broken in our lives. All of that was necessary for somebody else. The word of God tells us in Revelations 12, 11, that they overcame them by the blood of the lamb. That's the sacrifice of the cross and the words of their testimony, which means that, that, that we are prophets of the nation that we were called. Sweetheart, your experience in life, whatever it is, is for somebody else. Don't be upset. Don't be angry. Don't be mad. Woman of God, you know I've talked to you on a regular basis. And I know your heart. And I see what God is doing to you. Testimony is coming. Understand in this house tonight, the Spirit of God beat us here tonight. There are so many testimonies that's in this house right now that you have to embrace your season of greatness. You may not stand up here with a microphone. You may have a book inside of you. You may have a podcast that's going to be on the radio. You may have just a word that goes across social media, or it may be a jail ministry. It may be somebody in your family that you plant a seed in order for them to go and be the greatest person of all times in your family. But please know that what you went through, all you did was carry your cross. That was part of your assignment. So rejoice. Rejoice and find respect for yourself. Find respect in other people because they don't have to do what you need them to do and they don't have to meet your expectations. In Genesis, God gave us dominion over everything but people. So he never said that you, got, you get a chance to change my mind about something. You get an opportunity to plant a seed. What I choose to do with that seed and the time that it takes for that seed to germinate and the time it takes for that seed to sprout, that's in my season. That has nothing to do with you. So relieve yourself of the opinions of other people and understand that there was a great gift. That was a great sacrifice that was made. That was a gift that God is expecting us to reciprocate in one another. We have to apply the knowledge of the word. Like I said, the devil doesn't care that we come to church. He wants us to apply it. When we apply the word, it becomes the, the, the purpose of that 21-day fast is to get people that don't pray used to praying. You know, that's why we have to meet up here for that hour. You know, statistically, anything that we do for 21 days, it becomes a habit. Set an assignment for yourself for 21 days to be consistent. I promise you it will change your life. Release the secrets. I can give this testimony now. I remember going to my, my cousin's house and, and she started telling me, she's just really running her mouth about all these family secrets and I don't know why God blocked my ears but it sounded like she was doing that Charlie Brown wah, 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 wah thing because I didn't hear a word that she said. All I heard her say in the end was 
your grandmother knew about it and don't tell nobody else. And I'm like, okay, well, this is going to work out just fine because I really didn't hear anything that you had to say. But I also understand and I also realize there are family secrets. There are generational curses. There are things that happened when we were at that very young age when the enemy decided to come and steal our identity because he knew that God had formed us in the womb. He had knitted us together for purpose. He knew the assignment that we were going to have, so he tried to remove us from the grace of God and to keep us from ever really, ever really realizing what great gift God had for us in us. See, it's all hiding inside of you. So we have to forgive ourselves, we have to apply the word, and we have to release the secrets. Be okay with the fact that that secret really wasn't a secret. It's something that was supposed to be told to make you free. See, in the court of law, what they do is they have people to come up and get on the stand because they're witnesses. Well, we're to be witnesses for the goodness of the Lord, and in order for us to be witnesses, we got to tell it on the enemy. We can't let him have any strongholds binding us to our past and making us feel any kind of way because God said we were beautifully and wonderfully made. In every grace period and experience that he gave us, he gave us because he had a plan. He had a plan for us to stand here and cry and to release that thing and to give him glory. So understand that a part of your next level is to release your past. True love requires an agreement to respect, support, encourage, confront in love, and be consistent. We have to learn to meet people where they are because the scripture tells us to do that. I'm not supposed to expect you to be because you don't know my story for real. You don't know what I went through just tonight. Trust me, this is not easy to stand up on this, holding this microphone. No, it's not easy. It comes with a tremendous price because the enemy did not want me giving you this word tonight. Tonight, I know that there's people in this building and you don't understand why You don't understand why someone made you feel the way that they made you feel. You don't understand why someone may have violated you and stole your innocence. You don't know why you may have been treated unfairly. You don't know why there was lack in your home. You don't know why your mom was not there, your dad wasn't there. You don't know why One day you ended up addicted to drugs, alcohol, sex. You don't know why these things happened, but see, tonight we get to repent. Tonight we get to give God the greatest gift of perfect love. And that's just coming to the altar and asking God to forgive us. And once we do that, we get to be washed clean. Once we do that, we get a fresh start. Once we do that, we get to reprogram our minds with the word of God. Once we do that, we get to be consistent at least for 21 days just to see how this thing's going to work out. I guarantee you that as I stand here, it worked out, y'all. The journey wasn't easy, but it worked out. So on tonight, I'm going to start right here in the building, as difficult as it may be. You may have had a brother or sister inside this family because we're going into 2019, and it's imperative that we go to the next level. Inside this house, there may be someone that you may have had some differences with, I'm going to ask that you approach that person and get those differences resolved on tonight. I'm going to ask that you then come up to the altar and 
just come and submit yourself before the Lord because we do have to, we, we don't get to y'all just say, okay, well, I'm going to tell God about it. If it's possible, if that person is still living, we have to make amends or we have to go to that person and we have to make it right before we try to come and submit it before the Lord. Tonight is the night that we get to pay interest on our love account. I guarantee you that anything that you give to the Lord, he's going to give back to you a hundredfold. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over in the mighty name of Jesus. So right now, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to stand. Stand with the intent of relinquishing the control that the enemy has over your mind. Stand with the intent of expectation that your season is coming. Stand knowing that right now God has said that you are free from yourself and the past that has binded you. Stand right now and know that through the blood of Christ, we have been washed clean. Our debt has been paid. Stand and know that we get to do better. We get to receive better. We get to understand better, but it's going to take work. It's going to take work. There's not going to be a pretty bow on this gift that we give to God because there's going to come pain. Anything that we're carrying, it should be painful to birth. 